Hey all and welcome, Paul here, and today I am giving you a little bonus lecture. Now, in my last two lectures, we talked about the 5th and 6th centuries, how the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes came across the North Sea to Britain and created the kingdoms that would eventually form the country we now know as England. In the 6th century video, we briefly talked about Beowulf and how in the Christianized writing of the story, the monster Grendel was descended from Cain, from the story of Cain and Abel in the Bible. So I figured it would be nice if, before I put out the 7th century video, I gave a little bonus lecture on the story of Beowulf and the origins of it. Now, as I stated before, this story was extremely important. It was the first story ever written down in the English language, supposedly. Uh, it was a reflection of the Anglo-Saxons' pagan past, and it showed that even after converting to Christianity, that their love for heroic tales never changed. Despite all this, the story of Beowulf is not set in England. Strangely enough, the story is set in Scandinavia, in Denmark and Sweden. So let me give you a synopsis of the story now. The story starts off with a Danish king named Hrothgar, who is the lord of a great mead hall called Herat which means the Hall of the Stag. Now all the warriors in Herat live a very lavish lifestyle. Feasting, getting drunk on mead, receiving gifts of treasure from their lord in reward for their battle prowess. All living debaucherous and boisterous lifestyles. However, there is a monster named Grendel dwelling off in the nearby moor. This Grendel is said to have been one of the Skidugengen, a mythical creature of the Anglo-Saxons, which means shadow walker, a goblin, basically. And the Christian account claims that Grendel is descended from Cain, which I spoke of in my last lecture. Well, Grendel hates the sound of joy and happiness, which is all that comes out of Herat. Uh, he ends up attacking the hall and kills many of the sleeping warriors inside. Uh, across the sea, however, in Geatland, a young warrior named Beowulf hears of the attack and makes it his responsibility to go protect the Danes from this fiend from hell. So where is Geatland? Geatland is the southern portion of what is now Sweden. Originally, that territory was divided into two parts. The Swedes, or the Svir, in the north, which is of course how Sweden got its name, and the Geats in the south, or the Yeats is another pronunciation of it. Yeats. So Beowulf crossed the sea to Denmark to rid Hrothgar and his warriors of the beasts. And he has a very cunning plan too, to lure him in by doing the same thing that caused Grendel to come by in the first place, to have another one of their lavish celebrations and have everyone pass out under the table. Well, sure enough that plan worked. Grendel came once again to attack the warriors of Herat, but Beowulf was at the ready. And since no blade could harm the beast, Beowulf tears off the monster's arm, and Grendel then rushes off to the marsh where he lives, and soon after falls to his death. So Beowulf has, has one renown in Hrothgar's household. All his warriors praise his name, and they celebrate the fall of Grendel. However, Grendel's mother then comes to Herat to avenge her son's death. Now, it is said that Grendel's mother is more fierce than Grendel himself, because she has the anger of a protective mother bear. Uh, 
She slays Hrothgar's most trusted warrior, Ashura. She retreats, and now Beowulf and Hrothgar need to rid themselves of her. So they go to the lake where she lives, and Unferth, a warrior who had earlier challenged Beowulf, showed his newfound gratitude by offering Beowulf a mighty sword called Hrunting. Beowulf then jumps in the lake and swims down to the lair of Grendel's mother, because apparently Beowulf is able to hold his breath for an unrealistic amount of time. Uh, they begin to fight, and Beowulf's sword proves ineffective, but immediately after, Beowulf sees one of her swords hanging from the wall. So he takes that one, and he slays her with it, and succeeds. But then he tries to chop off the head of the corpse of Grendel, who he sees in her lair, and the blade melts, leaving only the hilt. Regardless... He swims back up to the top victorious. Hrothgar and his men praise him. Hrothgar gives him gifts, including a third sword called Naegling. Hrothgar then advises Beowulf on what it means to be a gift-giving lord, to always reward his followers, and to never fall into corruption. So he returns to Geatland and becomes king, a mighty king. However, 50 years later, in his old age, he faces a new challenge. Now he needs to slay a dragon. Now this part I'm sure you'll be able to tell was an inspiration on J.R.R. Tolkien when he wrote The Hobbit. A slave stole a golden chalice from the dragon's lair and the dragon leaves in a rage attacking the village. Beowulf and his warriors go to the cave to slay the dragon and Beowulf says that he should fight him on his own. He begins to do battle with the dragon but finds himself outmatched. His men, fearing for their lives, retreat but one of his men, Wiglaf, rushes to his aid. Wiglaf and Beowulf together end up slaying the dragon. However, Beowulf falls to his death and Wiglaf blames the death of Beowulf on his men's cowardice. Later, his body is burned on a great funeral pyre, a burning ship, which along with the death of Baldur is one of the ways we know of Norse and Germanic funerals. His ashes were then placed in a burial mound with all his treasures, uh, including the treasures from the dragon's lair. Uh, all the Geats uh, lament his death. They say that we will never be the same. We will forever be doomed without Beowulf. But his legend and his deeds shall live on throughout the ages. So that's the story. Now a few questions we have about it. When was the story told? When was it written down, and why was the story associated with the Anglo-Saxons set in Denmark and Sweden, and not in England? Especially considering that, in the 9th and 10th centuries, the Danes were England's greatest enemy. So that pretty much rules out those centuries as to when the story would have been created. There are scholars who believe that the original manuscript was written in the 970s, but then again, you wouldn't have written a story praising the Danes while they were raiding your churches and murdering everybody in your country. However, it is said that Alfred the Great appreciated the story and said that it had intellectual value and was an important story to the Anglo-Saxons and their history. However, I believe, and many others will believe, that the first manuscript was written a little earlier than that. It is likely that the story is rooted uh, before that too, between the 6th and 8th centuries, and there are strong connections for each of those centuries. Also, it is important to note, the time it was written down might have been uh, long after when the story was first told. It would have existed in spoken word form long before it was actually written down. Uh, in the early Middle Ages... Literacy was a privilege. 
it was a privilege of the church. There were kings and nobles even who were illiterate. It wasn't like now when reading and writing is just something everybody is able to do that you're taught at a young age. Um, however, they did have bards or shops as the Anglo-Saxons called them. They were a culture big on storytelling. Uh, the shop would tell the story in the mead hall while everyone was celebrating. That was that was their entertainment at the time. That was their television or their concerts. It was the shop telling heroic tales in the mead hall. It is also likely that when it was told in spoken word form, it existed as a purely pagan story. As I said before, literacy was a privilege of the church. So when they wrote the story down, it was written with a Christian twist. And still, this goes to show, though, that even after adopting a new god, the Anglo-Saxons still revered heroic stories and legends from their past. Now, in the written version, Hrothgar and Beowulf and many other characters are Christian, which is really a romanticization. The story is supposedly set in the 6th century. The Danes did not become Christian until the late 10th century. And that was just some of them. They didn't fully all become Christian. You know, and this was after they had been Vi Vikings raiding in England. Sweden didn't become Christian until the 11th century. Maybe even later than that, you know, fully. There may have been a few independent Christians here and there, but not at the scale that the story portrays. A few of Frostgar's warriors are still pagan, and there is almost like a disclaimer written about them, like an excuse these heathens, for they didn't know any better back then. It reads, Sometimes at pagan shrines, they vowed offerings to idols, swore oaths, that the killer of souls might come to their aid and save the people. That was their way, their heathenish hope. Deep in their hearts, they remembered hell. The almighty judge of good deeds and bad, the Lord God, head of the heavens and high king of the world, was unknown to them. O oh, cursed is he who in time of trouble has to thrust his soul in the fire's embrace, forfeiting help. He has nowhere to turn. But blessed is he who after death can approach the Lord and find friendship in the Father's embrace. Now in many ways the story is a reflection of the Anglo-Saxons' own pagan past. It is a way to appreciate their past, and that line is a way to ask the reader to forgive their ancestors, for they did not know, did not yet know of the one true God. But this brings me to something I had said earlier. The story of Beowulf is not set in England. The story is set in Scandinavia. So what's the deal there? Well, let's not forget that the Anglo-Saxons originally came from Northern Europe. They migrated to Britain in the 5th century. Now, in my last lecture on the 6th century, I talked about how you had three tribes. The Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes. How the Angles formed the kingdoms of Northumbria, Mercia, and East Anglia how the Saxons formed the kingdoms of Wessex, Essex, and Sussex, and how the Jutes formed the kingdom of Kent. But I didn't say much about where specifically these tribes originally came from. The Angles came from Angeln, which takes up the Schleswig-Holstein area in northern Germany. The Saxons, as the name suggests, came from Saxony, just west of the Angles, and bleeding into parts of the modern-day Netherlands. And the Jutes came from Jutland, the western portion of modern-day Denmark.
Keyword though, modern day. The Jutes were not the same as the Danes. The Danes were on the islands east of Jutland and they expanded throughout the course of this period. So the story would have been in praise of their old neighbors from before they crossed the sea to Britain, in particular the neighbors of the Jutes. Which brings me to my next point. There is a segment in Beowulf called the Finsburg Fragment, or the fight at Finsburg. This is after Beowulf had slain Grendel. Beowulf and all of Hrothgar's warriors are feasting and merrymaking, and a story is told by a shop about a battle at a place called Finsburg, meaning Finn's stronghold. Now, Finn was the king of the Frisians, the ancestors of the modern day Dutch, where the Netherlands is now. In this story, there are Jutish mercenaries on both the Danish side and the Frisian side. Now, this could be because the Jutes at the time were a displaced, lost people, many being driven out of their homes by the Danes. So at the time, we can imagine they were a people desperate to find lords to serve, which in part would also explain them fighting as mercenaries for Vortigern. Now, in the story, a truce is made after the battle, and Finn is married to the Danish princess Hildeberg to secure this truce. Now, after she had been in Frisia for a while, her brother, the prince Hnaf, decides he wants to go visit his sister, and he is joined by a host of warriors and a jute named Hengist. Could this be the same Hengist who in the 5th century crossed the sea to Britain with his brother Horsa and created the kingdom of Kent? And could it be that them leaving their homes could have been due to being displaced by the growing power of the Danes? Well, in Finn's Hall, a fight breaks out between the Danes and the Frisians. They are feuding once again. Hildebert's son is killed, as well as Hanaf. However, the Danes are stranded in Finn's Hall because it is now winter, so they end up having to make another peace. Once spring comes, the Danes can't handle being at peace with Finn again, considering the fact that he had killed their lord. Fighting breaks out again, and the Danes are victorious against the Frisians, and they kill King Finn. They then take the Princess Hildeberg back to her native Denmark. Hengist, however, fears he will be blamed for this disaster, so he ends up convincing a bunch of Jutes on the Frisian side to join him before taking Hildeberg back. Now, J.R.R. Tolkien, who definitely believes that this Jute named Hengist is the same Hengist who led the Anglo-Saxon migration to Britain, he ties the two stories together. Tolkien had written that after bringing Hildebert back to Denmark, Hengist was told he wasn't welcome anymore for allowing this mess to happen. So he takes his band of Jutes and perhaps some Danes too and crosses over the sea to settle in Britain. This is a big leap, but it makes a lot of sense. Now it is said that the story of Beowulf takes place in the second half of the 6th century and that Hrothgar was based on a real historical figure. He is part of a semi-legendary Danish royal family called the Shieldings. There are also accounts from the Scandinavian side that mention these Shieldings. There's also a Norse saga called the Skjöldunga Saga, and they are also mentioned in Snorri's Edda. From what we can see from medieval chronicles, this Shielding dynasty would have existed from the 5th to the 6th centuries. We also might know where the great Mead Hall Herat was located, the hall that the Shieldings ruled in. In the southwest of Lyra, near Roskilde, the remains of a great hall was excavated in the late 80s. Wood from the foundation was radion carbon dated to about 880, the Viking Age. However, 
They later found that the hall was built over the remains of older halls, the previous one dating back to the 7th century, and then much later, around 2004-2005, an older hall was uncovered on the site, dating back to the mid-6th century, the period of the shieldings. Could this be where Rothgar held his boisterous banquets? There's another archaeological uncovery related to Beowulf, not in Denmark where the story is set, but in England where the story was written. This of course is the Sutton Hoo ship burial, the burial of the King of East Anglia in the early 7th century, King Redwald. Now I will be talking more about King Redwald in my next video on the 7th century. Right now I'm going to talk about his connection with Beowulf. In the 1930s in Suffolk, England, the southern part of East Anglia, archaeologists uncovered a giant ship burial said to have belonged to King Redwald. Now, Redwald was part of the Woofinga dynasty, the descendants of Woofa, the first king of the East Angles. It is thought that there is some kind of connection between this Woofinga dynasty that Redwald was part of and the Wolflings, a Geatish dynasty that is mentioned in Beowulf. The Wolflings are also mentioned in the Old English poem Widseath, which catalogs the kings and heroes of late antiquity in Northern Europe. Furthermore, a lot of the artifacts found in Sutton Hoo are strikingly similar to artifacts uncovered in Sweden, where Beowulf was from. The Vendel and Valsgard excavations are practically identical to the ones in Sutton Hoo. Also, these are all items described in the story. Helmets with boar crests on them. Sword hilts inlaid with garnet. Decorated shields. Not to mention, both of these burials seem to parallel how Beowulf's funeral is described. Somewhat. Beowulf was burned in his ship and his ashes were placed in a mound with all his treasures. Redwald seems to have just been buried in his ship. Still, there are more similarities than there are differences. There is another connection between Redwald and Beowulf. Now, I had mentioned earlier that Beowulf is in many ways both a Christian and a pagan story. And King Redwald was indeed both a Christian and a pagan. According to Bede, he accepted Christ after being preached to by the Canterbury Mission. However, he did not give up the old gods. He placed Jesus alongside Woden and Thunor. This is further demonstrated in his very pagan burial. So it is very likely that the story of Beowulf was first told in Redwald's court, with his supposed connection to Scandinavia, the fact that he was a Christian with a strong reverence for the old ways, and the similarity in the things that he owned with the items mentioned in Beowulf, which are also similar to items uncovered in Sweden. Now this is when Beowulf might have first been told, but how about when it was first written down? Many will say it would have been written in the century following Redwald, the 8th century. Some will say that it was written in Northumbria during the time of the Venerable Bede, so the first half of the 8th century. There was, after all, a renaissance of literacy and education in Northumbria at the time. Now, another candidate for Beowulf being written in the early 8th century is by a clergyman named Aldhelm. It said he's the one who wrote it. Now, Aldhelm was from Wessex. He was the abbot of Malmesbury and later the bishop of Sherborne and he was also a writer of Latin poetry. Now the connection here is that it is thought that Aldhelm wrote the Liber Monstrorum, meaning the Book of Monsters, literally just a book of mythical creatures and beasts that the Anglo-Saxons believed in. Now the big connection here is obvious. There are monsters in Beowulf, and it's the Book of Monsters. Uh, Liber Monstrorum also mentions King Higelac, the king of the Geats, as mentioned in Beowulf. But this is all just a theory. So 
we don't know if Aldhelm wrote Beowulf. We don't even know if Aldhelm wrote the Liber Monstrorum. Uh, and we don't know if the author who wrote the Liber Monstrorum is the author who wrote Beowulf. Uh, it is possible, yes, but we just don't know. It is also theorized to have been written down in the later half of the 8th century uh, in Mercia during the reign of that most famous of Mercian monarchs, Offa. The reason this is theorized is because there are a couple of lines in Beowulf uh, that reference an Offa. Now obviously this is not the same Offa being set centuries earlier. The Offa mentioned in Beowulf is said to be Offa of Angeln, a legendary king from the land that the Angles had originated from. It is thought, however, that the Offa who ruled Mercia in the late 8th century was descended from this Offa of Angel uh, from before the Anglo-Saxon migration. Now, as I said before, Beowulf is a Christianization of the heroic tales from their pagan past, possibly existing purely as a pagan story at one time, but this didn't mean that every Christian approved of it. Around the end of the 8th century, heroic stories such as Beowulf were extremely popular in the monastic communities that would write them down. Stories that were previously only told in spoken word. However, despite the Christian filter that these stories would be written through, many in the church would have still disapproved of the nature of these stories, celebrating violence, revenge, and pride. We see this in a letter sent from a clergyman named Alcuin, who had studied in the court of Charlemagne, sent to the Bishop of Lindisfarne, Higbald, around the year 797, which reads, The King of Heaven must not be mentioned with pagan kings who are lamenting in hell. What has Ingeld to do with Christ? Who is Ingeld? Ingeld is a figure mentioned in Beowulf the son of a king named Froda, from a royal dynasty called the Hethobards, which means war beards. Uh, this dynasty is said to have existed in Old Saxony and were said to be a branch of the Germanic tribe, the Lombards, which means long beards. He is also mentioned in the Widseath poem, which I mentioned earlier. Maybe there was more stories that existed in England about this Ingild that were not written down. We are not sure. But we do know that a clergyman sent a letter to the Bishop of Lindisfarne asking, What has Ingeld to do with Christ? Basically complaining that the monks should focus less on heroic sagas and legends and more on the Holy Scriptures. It almost gives off the vibe that during the time when Christianity had become really ingrained in Anglo-Saxon England, these sort of heroic tales were almost treated the way heavy metal music would be treated in the 80s, or the way violent video games would be treated in the early 2000s. Uh, it was something that the young people loved, but older, more conservative folks may have seen them as being unwholesome. Now Beowulf may have been written down during this period. It may have continued to have been written down in many different forms throughout the following centuries, despite the Danes becoming enemies to the Anglo-Saxons in the following centuries. The oldest existing manuscript of Beowulf is dated back to the 11th century. Of course, this does not mean it was the first time it was ever written. It is more than likely a copy, and it is still highly likely that it was first written in the 8th century, but it is definitely something to talk about. Uh, this manuscript is part of what was called the Nawal Codex, a collection of poetic manuscripts. Uh, the Beowulf poem is said to have been written down by two scribes, which we know by the differences in handwriting.
the two scribes are said to have also written in the codex the poem of Judith based on the Israelite Judith of Bethulia from the Old Testament and the writing style of that poem is so similar to the way Beowulf is written that they it is highly theorized that by the same scribes and the time that this manuscript was made is also something to consider it was during the reign of Canute the Great the Dane who had become King of England after converting to Christianity also ruling his native Denmark and neighboring Norway at the same time creating the Anglo-Scandinavian Empire or the North Sea Empire as it was called so this makes sense then a story praising the Danes in the 6th century being written in England in the 11th century when England was ruled by a Dane a Dane who had become Christian but there are also strong cases for the earlier centuries the story of Beowulf would have existed in the oral tradition much much earlier and would have been handed down from generation to generation and could have just as easily been written down first in the 8th century this 11th century manuscript could have definitely been a copy with the original text being lost to time now unfortunately this manuscript became damaged in a fire in the 18th century ironically enough this fire was in a place called the Ashburnham house what are the odds the manuscript was saved but there are pieces of it that were damaged so the translators have really had to fill in their own pieces to the puzzle with the missing parts uh, we can consider ourselves lucky that it only got damaged and not destroyed so in conclusion we don't fully know when Beowulf was first written down or when it was first told and we don't know what those damaged parts could have originally said we have theories and we can discuss those theories all day but at the end of the day we don't truly know what we do know is that the story stands the test of time it is still told to this day even having a blockbuster movie made out of it in 2007 the story had a profound influence on the fantasy genre in particular the works of J.R.R. Tolkien and we historians will continue to study it and will continue to learn new things as we do well that is all for my bonus lecture join us next time when we talk about the seventh century we'll talk more about Redwald as well as the powerful Northumbrian kings who ruled Britain with iron fists What's through hall?